When trust is broken, it's very, very difficult to repair. Kia was unbelievably uh, dishonest in, in what he did. And of course, what's happened since then, it's the worst position I've ever personally known the Labour Party to be in. Welcome to Downstream here on Navarra Media. My name is Aaron Bastani. This week's guest is Len McCluskey, General Secretary of Britain's largest private sector union, Unite, until 2020. McCluskey is most widely known for his support of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader, with Unite backing the Islington MP since 2015. As a result, McCluskey had a front row seat throughout the Corbyn leadership, witnessing some of the biggest stories of the decade, from Brexit to the 2016 chicken coup and the 2017 and 2019 general elections. But he was also familiar with both Ed Miliband and Keir Starmer as Labour leader, saw the collapse of Labour in Scotland and was a leading player in an emerging anti-austerity movement after 2010. What did all of that accomplish? What lessons can be learned? And are Britain's trade unions now better placed to fight against falling living standards today than they were a decade ago? Len McCluskey, welcome to Downstream. Thanks for inviting me. Good to be here again. You start in the world of work at 18? Yep. You go down the docks in Liverpool. Uh -huh. How do you go from that, somebody who's not from a, a powerful family or even a, a massively political family, uh, to becoming one of the most powerful trade union leaders in the country? Well, I suppose I was a child of the 60s and of course everything was changing in the 60s. You know, people were becoming politicised by the Vietnam War, by the civil rights movements in um, America. Indeed, the civil rights movements in Northern Ireland, the Catholic uh, civil rights movement, which is very close, Liverpool's a Catholic city. Um, so it was a kind of very vibrant um, uh, period. And I came from a working class background where um, it was solidly labor. It was kind of more or less accepted that you uh, labor was the, uh, was the party that would uh, be on the side of working people. Harold Wilson had just been elected in 64 and again in 66. So it was all happening, guys. So uh, you, you would recall the romantic. Uh, image of Che Guevara on t-shirts everywhere and so I knew a little bit about what was happening in Cuba and <clears throat> when I went down to work on the docks of course um, solidarity that community spirit that I'd experienced uh, since I was a child in in my community was very very strong and um I got involved very, very quickly with a, a kind of disputes, um, uh, young workers on the docks, because I wasn't a registered dock worker, I was a, an ancillary worker. And we weren't paid the, um, uh, the, the, the adult rate until, I don't know, 23, 24 years of age, despite the fact that we were doing the, um, the same work. Uh, as as our fellow workers. And so I organized a meeting of young people, there's about 150 from different companies along the docks, and we decided to try to do something about it. And um, uh, we were successful, even though our own branch in the union was against us. The older men were uh, thought we were being a bit cheeky, uh, asking for uh, adult rates. and. Um, we threatened strike action and we were successful. The young workers there uh, persuaded me to run, to become a shop steward, um, which I did do. So at the age of 90, I became a shop steward and that was it really. You know, you just get involved, you get sucked into the activism uh, of what was going on. And it just flowed from there. Uh, my politics became stronger. I I was involved in the anti-apartheid uh, movement. Ted Heath was in power, the Industrial Relations Act. The TUC, for once, uh, did something, organised people coming out and demonstrating, and it looked very much as though uh, the, there was the prospect of serious industrial action. So all of that um, just seeped into, into me. You said the TUC for once, and what comes across throughout the book? 
particularly the first half, is an ambivalence or even disdain for a certain kind of trade unionism. Elsewhere, you write in the 1980s um, how the TUC at one point responded with its customary spinelessness. Um, can, can you talk about that period a little bit? Because obviously you've joined the world of work, the labour movement, at its sort of apogee, its peak. Then you're there, you're, you're gaining a, a role of leadership and influence during the 1980s when obviously things are, are coming apart. Looking back for us now, 40 years later, we think that was all inevitable. But your account really is that to an extent, elements of the left, elements of people who should have known better were a sort of handmade for Thatcher. Is that fair? <clears throat> yeah, I think it is to an extent in this regard. I don't want to be too dismissive of the TUC. The truth of the matter is the TUC brings all unions together and then has to see common ground. And what tends to happen is they come up with the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator would never be to stand up and fight back in a, in a serious fashion. And the 80s proved that. It was a, a terrible, dark period. And Thatcher and her henchmen had uh, effectively worked out a strategy. Uh, they learned from when the miners defeated Heath in 72 and 74. They learned their lessons. We don't learn our lessons. I talk in my book about the steel strike in 1980. That was the first. I mean, everybody, of course, talks about the the miners' strike and then <clears throat> the print workers and whopping and then the dockers in 1989, all of which ended in terrible uh, defeats. In 1980, there was a real possibility that when she took on the steel workers, um, that we could have defeated uh, and... Unfortunately, once again, workers were sold out by right-wing um, general secretaries. Because at the point in time, I th think the steelworks had been on strike for about 12 weeks, and at that point in time where the dockers uh, took a decision, my union took a decision to call a national uh, dock strike, which at that time would have brought the country to a standstill. Um, the leadership of the steel workers, the ISTC, I pulled the plug on the strike. And I often think back if people would have been strong enough then, um, whether we'd have had to suffer Thatcherism uh, for, for as long as we did. Do you ever speak to, to people in those circles who attacked Labour in Liverpool, who attacked certain left-wingers, activists? Do you ever sort of ask them, do they regret what happened? Did they take the sort of wrong set of choices? Because they're looking at a country now, 40 years later, poorer, more unequal, trade unions have been decimated, working people can't get a fair day's pay. What do they say? Nope, we made the right decision. No, I mean, I don't think uh, if you ever come across leaders who say, well, we made a mistake. I know we'll talk about 2017, but it's like the, the, the right wing now in 2019. Um, they don't want to admit their mistakes now and back then. No, it was always Scargill was to blame or militant trade unions and <clears throat> violence on the picket line. And then you had the trade union leaders who were complicit with the government. Um, and the TUC, unfortunately, at the time, and I'd say took its historic spineless position because the print union, for example, um, following TUC policy, when they took strike action, uh, the TUC then repudiated them because so oh, it was against the law and this was happening and that was happening. And it, it taught me lessons all along. I mean, I would never rely on the TUC if I was ever in a battle. Um, yes, you could get uh, moral support in that. And I should quickly say that the current General Secretary, Frances O'Grady, I think is first class. I think she does a, a great job. But the nature of the TUC um, uh, has changed as well. The nature of workers, uh, there's a, a different kind of union a majority in the TUC these days. And I remember just... Uh, uh, during my time when we were talking about the prospect of uh, a general strike because of things that were happening. And virtually 
every union, uh, with the exception of the odd one or two, were absolutely opposed to it because within their rule books, uh, you can't take action that is deemed uh, political, that's unlawful, and there was no real fight there. So, yeah, I don't wish to be uh, too um, critical of the TUC. It is what it is. It's uh, um, and can do some great work in, in in different areas, but in a in a crunch situation which we had in the eighties. No, it was nowhere to be seen. People might be watching this or listening and thinking, why are you going over stuff 40 years ago? Why, you know, bring back old wounds? But I feel like the left and the Labour movement will keep on making the same mistakes until we have an honest accounting of what happened in the 80s. And even now, people say, well, Thatcher won because 83 Manifesto, because organised Labour was too radical. They don't mention the Social Democrat split. They don't talk about actually the organised Labour movement never really put up a fight. They don't talk about the fact that going back maybe arguably 10 years, the wider left didn't have a, a propositional vision for the future. Bits of it did, like Benism, but it was never a, a mass project of the Labour leadership at any point. And, and, and I think until we have that honest accounting, I think we'll keep on making the same mistake. Are you we made the same mistake in 2010. I think we're doing the same now. You're 100% correct. Of course you are. You have to understand history. Otherwise, you make the same mistakes. And indeed... I've said in my book that in every dispute and every period I went through, I learned lessons. I learned lessons so as if I was ever in a position of power, I would be able to take a different course of action. So you're 100% correct. Of course, we have to look back at various situations. I, in the 70s, as a young activist, was um, a Benite. Tony Benn was my political hero. Uh, and remember, he only lost the deputy leadership because Neil Kinney switched his votes. Neil was regarded back then as um, as a very strong left winger. Mm. Great picture of him with uh, uh, Dennis Skinner when they refused to go to the Lords because the Queen's speaking there. He's such a passionate Republican. Yeah, yeah. And 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 doesn't that tell you things about the nature of the Labour Party, which we'll come on to talk about? Because even uh, left comrades um, can be influenced in a way that suits the establishment. And there's no doubt that Neil uh, was persuaded to disregard all his comrades and his friends and his supporters um, to make certain that Tony didn't take up that role. Um, and of course, from then, Neil moved very quickly towards the the centre-right and the so-called modernisers. What do you make of Neil Kinnock? What sort of, what do you think of him today? Because his, his arc is, is, was seen as sort of necessary for Blairism, although I, I don't think I've ever seen so many people praise somebody who lost twice. One, uh, it should be said, once he lost, he got a lower percentage of the vote than Cormand in 2019. We, we rarely hear this. But, I mean, that's one person. I said, do you ever talk to people and they say, oh, maybe I made some mistakes? If you speak to Neil Kinnock, no, does he ever he, say I made a mistake? No, he would never. He would never say he made a mistake. Quite the opposite, because of course now he's a, a grandee of the Labour Party, very much part of the establishment, and uh, people regard him on the right uh, of, of our movement as uh, as a saviour, the person who moved rapidly towards um, a, a centre right position in preparation for. For Blairism now, I don't dismiss all of that uh, as as being evil. People can make a judgment call, and there's this great debate that's gone on ever since I've been in politics about what's the good of having principles if you never get into power, and what's the point of having power if you don't implement uh, principles as you uh, as your guide and. And therefore, judgment calls need to be made. And I think he would say, uh, not speaking on behalf of Neil, of course, but he would say that everything he did was correct and has brought Labour to, you know, 13 years of power uh, under Tony Blair. Blair, of course, was, uh, was full of praise for uh, Kinnock when he got elected. So, yeah, no, they, they would never say, oh, we, we were wrong here or we were wrong there. Were New Labour a failure? Um, 
Well, it depends how you judge failure, because when uh, Labour won in 1997 and ended that long, long period of horrible conservatism and the evil creed of Thatcherism, it was a great day, a bright new dawn. Things can only get better. And there's no doubt that they introduced lots of good things. There was um, there was improvements made. I mean, you know, Blair was central to the Good Friday Agreement, something that very close to my heart coming from Liverpool. There were things like the national uh, minimum wage was introduced, the protection for workers who go on strike. Tony never spoke about that a lot. I think that won't sneak through. But the problem was, it's what's happening as well today, because what Blairism was uh, very clear was that they were never going to challenge the establishment. So that creed that we all bought into of the irreversible shift in the balance of power in favour of working people, that was never on the agenda. During that 13 years of Labour government, we lost 1 million manufacturing jobs in the UK because on the economy, he bought into the Thatcherite belief of free labour and et cetera, et cetera, during the 13 years. Inequality widened. Um, the, the, the reality is that the poor became poorer and the rich became richer. And at the end of it all, we, you know, we still had 13 million of our citizens living below the poverty line. And that's the inevitable. So how do you judge was Blair a success? In the context of that irreversible shift in favour of working people, it was an absolute failure. The further we move away from 2010, I think the, the stranger it will be when people hear that New Labour achieved so much. Like when you talk to somebody now who said 25, they're renting. They can't afford to buy a place. They certainly can't think about having kids, generally speaking, particularly in bigger cities. They've got a huge amount of student debt. And I think if you say to somebody like that, new labor changed your life, <laughs> they think, what the hell are you talking about? Whereas if you say labor created the NHS, they say, well, that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I had this operation as a kid. I broke my arm. It didn't cost anything. My mum or grandma's benefited from it. Okay, I, I can understand what you're talking about. But the further we move away from particularly after 2008, to, to carry on with these same lines, it just seems, it does seem bizarre to me. And I know for a big part of the Labour Party membership, it's like, this is just for bottom. No, it was good. They were better than the Tories. I get that. But if a kid's got 40 grand debt and they're giving half their earnings every week to a landlord, you, you want them to revere Tony Blair? Spot on. And that's precisely why. Unless you have a radical progressive government that is prepared to challenge the um, uh, establishment, then the gains that you make will inevitably uh, evaporate uh, when stacked against the, the continued unfairness uh, within our society. Uh, remember, <laughs> um, Blairism never changed a single law on uh, trade unions that Thatcher brought in. In fact, he took great delight in, ta in telling the business community that the labour laws in Britain were the most restrictive, and whilst he's prime minister, they would remain so. The fact that British workers had didn't have the same protections as every other group of workers in uh, Europe is is quite astonishing. Can you tell me something nice about Tony Blair? But personally, not, you know, the Good Friday Agreement well, he, or well, he was is there a, when you met him, is there something he once said? Was there a nice quality about <laughs> him that you sort of remember? No, I mean, no, he, okay. he, he was charismatic, wasn't he? There's no doubt he was a very astute politician, uh, a nice guy. I never met him um, that often, met him a few times before he was leader. I met him when I was a national official. Um, How did he come across then? Did, he, he, did yeah. you think he'd one day be prime minister? Uh, not particularly, but he was intensive, uh, um, attentive, and he was uh, interested in what was being said, or he appeared to be. Um, I mean, Tony Blair was uneasy in the trade union arena. He, he was just awkward in it, which is why, of course, Brown, was always the one that was sent to speak at the TUC. Who's the best 
and worst Labour MP that you've had to work with? Let's um, foreclose party leaders, so like Bourbon and McDonald, but like surprise us a little maybe. I don't know. I've come across a number of right-wing Labour MPs who um, weren't uh, particularly impressive. Um, I, I talk in my book of an encounter with uh, with a few of them that um, uh, Chris Leslie being born, I think I say I wouldn't send them across the road with a message. Um, and there were a few like that. Uh, I mean, lots of obviously good uh, Labour MPs over uh, a period of time who were, you know, looking to fight and be on our side. Today's people like Ian Lavery, um, a good, strong working class lad, and the younger ones uh, who are coming up, Dan Carden, um, very, very impressive. Uh, and I mean, I think. Um, you have to try and take politicians as you as you find them and try to understand the difficulties that they themselves are, are placed with. In terms of the lobby, Westminster lobby, do you think they're detached from reality? I mean, a good example is Brexit. You were going out to the shop floor, you were talking to your members, and actually you were like, these people want the, the referendum observed. And there was a very different conversation going on amongst much of the liberal media in, particularly, uh, in particular. Do, do, do you sort of think they're a bit detached from reality? Is there something we need to remedy about that, that they're, it's a kind of insider club that's insulated from yeah. the broader public? Well, there's no doubt that they are detached from reality, but also play a very key role in the establishment's wish to... Um, preserve the status quo, i.e. to preserve the privileged um, position and the privileged elites. And I'm often asked but all these uh, media, how, how can we challenge it? Shouldn't the trade unions have their own newspaper? And we've tried all of that. <laughs> uh, to be honest, what you're doing is the great challenge to the uh, to mainstream media and, and other, um, uh, other bodies like your own. Is there a newspaper you read? Is there a source of media you go, I really, apart from Navarra Media, you go, I really, I really trust what these people write and <laughs> no, say? Well, I, I, I read three newspapers, the, uh, the, the Daily Star, the Morning Star, sorry, <laughs> not the Daily Star, the Morning Star, uh, which of course is the only paper that consistently reports on uh, workers, on the workers' side. I get the Daily Mirror because I've always got the Daily Mirror. And strangely enough, I like reading the Times. Um, uh, I think it's uh, it's interesting to um, uh, to know what your your enemy are up to. Uh, Do you think it's better written than the Guardian? I have no time for the Guardian um, for this reason. At least I know where I stand with the Times. Um, the Guardian purport on the one hand to be, you know, liberal, leftish, and yet um, when issues arise, they always seem to me to, um, to, to kind of side with the establishment. Their, their treatment over Corbyn um, uh, finished completely. I used to read The Guardian because you're supposed to, <laughs> but uh, I don't read it anymore. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, for me, I look at my weekend sort of reading habits, and I sometimes read the Sunday Times because they just, they just land massive stories. I mean, not always honest reporting in there, and the comment journalism isn't great, but you have to get one or two really knockout stories every week, and the, the, the uh, weekend FT. And I look at the offer from the sort of liberal left journalism, and it's, you're not bringing me stories, you're not adding any value, you're not, even like you say, the Morning Star, it's a different angle on something. It's original. I, it's a problem for liberal media, sort of generally speaking. Um, and like you say, this is somebody who's, you know, I would go on the BBC and the Guardian. Those would be the, literally the first two websites I would input into a computer for 10 years. But now, you know, I, I don't look at it as journalism, which I'd be willing to pay for, which no, is quite a big thing to say, actually. And I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because... Um the the Corbyn period um, had an impact in so many different ways. 
The BBC's uh, handling of Corbyn was disgraceful and they ought to be ashamed of themselves. And so was The Guardian. And it struck me that here's these kind of liberal, uh, uh, you know, progressive liberal approach to, to life, except where it threatens the status quo. And when it threatens the status quo, they revert to type. And that's exactly what they did. I think I used the terminology in my book that the Guardian um, would be the first to fight for the poor and the vulnerable people, uh, providing the poor and the vulnerable people don't start fighting for themselves. I used to go crazy reading the Guardian until, uh, you know, my partner said to me, stop reading it. And I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. Before Corbyn, you were the Secretary General for Unite. Uh, or General, General Secretary or General, General? Secretary. Not, it's not the UN. <laughs> uh, General Secretary of Unite and Ed Miliband was leader of the Labour Party. How did you find him as Labour leader? Well, uh, very, very frustrating. Um, I like Ed. Um, he did make the break from New Labour, which was, um, was bold of him to do so. Um, he took on David, his brother. Uh, he could have easily seen David as moving in as leader and Ed be giving some, you know, high office. Um, so he was brave enough to take uh, on uh, New Labour and then distance himself from New Labour and basically say, we now have to do something different. We have to reconfigurate our values and where we're coming from. Um, the problem I found with Ed was that he didn't have the courage of his convictions. And um, it must have been difficult for him. Of course, he's surrounded by people who are telling him to be cautious. And uh, unfortunately, he was too cautious. Um, when I look back and I spent a period of the book analysing uh, my relationship with Ed, um, had he have taken a different course on certain issues, then um, I believe he would be Prime Minister to this day. I believe he'd have won in 2015 and he'd have got a second term. And so it's a great tragedy that uh, he, he wasn't able to do that. On the great issue of the day, austerity, he was on the wrong side of the argument. He did call the police on United. <laughs> I mean, how did that make you feel? Oh, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? Well, it's, it, it made me feel very, very angry, and it still does today. Um, I'll never forgive him for it. Uh, Falkirk was the issue. The Labour Party, under um, the General Secretaryship of Ian McNichol, put together a trumped-up um, uh, accusation uh, about Unite and um, Miliband went along with it. It was quite extraordinary that we were accused. The media cut us to ribbons. I personally was accused. My union was accused of all kinds of things, sharp practices, signing membership forms without the individual known, all kinds of terrible, terrible stuff. Um which uh, was untrue, wrong, and of course, ultimately then proved wrong. But right in, in the middle of this uh, angry uh, position, the Labour Party were used to coming up with sham investigations to do in individuals <clears throat> and normally get away with it. <clears throat> this time they did a sham investigation, but it was against the largest affiliates. Well, we weren't going to lie down and let them walk all over us. But then he sent the report to Police Scotland. Unbelievable. The first time in the history of the Labour Party that uh, the, the party had sent um, a complaint about a trade union, let alone its largest affiliate, to, um, to Police Scotland to be investigated. What do you think that says about the man? Oh, I think it's, In the absence of obviously compelling I, evidence. I think it, it, it says everything about him. It says that he was persuaded by those that were around him uh, that this was the time to take on the big bad trade unions and who was bigger and badder than Len McCluskey. Unbelievable, you know, did, did he believe what he was doing? Who knows, he was in... He was definitely 
encouraged by those people out. It's time for you to show um, the trade unions where you stand, take on the big bad uh, unions and big bad Len McCluskey. And Blair uh, congratulated him, so did Mandelson. Uh, it was quite outrageous. And then, of course, um, Police Scotland looked at it and took 30 seconds to say, this is nonsense. Um, but he never apologised from that day to this, and I'll never forgive it's a shame it ended the way it is. It's strange, though, that now in, in Stormers Labour, I know we're going to come on to that, that Miliband is the only one in the cabinet who's got a, an element of progressiveness in him. Tom Watson, before we talk about Corbyn and Starmer, you guys were close friends. You were housemates at one yeah, point. Yeah, we were, yeah, yeah. Tom Watson became the avatar for everything which you're criticising anti-democratic practices, opposition to progressive policy and so on. What happened? Did he change? Did you change? Oh, no, Tom definitely changed. And, of course, I haven't spoken to Tom since the, uh, since the coup of uh, 2016. So it's, oh, blimey, six years ago. Yeah, we were friends. He, he was a um, very engaging guy, uh, good fun, um, good to debate and discuss. Uh, People have constantly asked me, well, what happened? And the only person who could answer that would be Tom. Tom came from a background of, um, of a right-wing union, the AWU, who used to pick out talented young people and used to deliberately send them into the political arena. And Tom was one of them. Um, uh, and he entered politics as, as a right-winger. Uh, but changed, went on a journey. I remember him telling me about Tony Blair. He said, Lenny, Tony Blair dazzled me. Uh, that's how impressive and charismatic Blair was. But then he began to move on this journey. And uh, we all know he was part of the, the so-called coup, the Curry House coup that uh, uh, brought Blair down or ended Blair's... Um, and then... Of course, he got involved in issues, took on the Murdoch press. Uh, and strangely enough, and I talk about this in my book, I remember being, having a drink with him one night and I said, Tom, uh, you do realise you've become a working class hero. And he said to me, oh, no, no. I said, you have, honestly, what you've done, taking on the Murdoch press like that. Fantastic. I said, but take a piece of advice from me. Don't ever let the left down. Because if you do, they'll never forgive you. Now, I don't know why I said that to him. But obviously, he then changed. I mean, the only thing I can assume and think of is that uh, Corbynism scared him. And he reverted to type. I, I don't have any other... But he, he behaved very irrationally. So even on things like Brexit, you know, he was in a, a solid leave seat and then he decided to become the sort of face of Remain before the 2019 election. So that suggests to me, people say, well, that's because he believed in it. It's not. It suggests to me that he wasn't thinking clearly for a period of several years. And I, I wonder what triggered that. Well, I don't, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it's a question really, because I think I, I say in my book, over Brexit, over this sudden conversion, uh, you know, did did he ever believe in anything for real, in a genuine sense? Um, he he moved away. Remember, he, we supported him in Unite uh, for the deputy um, uh, deputy leadership role. Um, he was uh, involved in trying to persuade people to put Corbyn on the ballot paper. Uh, he definitely had moved to the left. Um, and then all of a sudden, things started to change. His role as deputy leader was, was terrible. He was constantly undermining uh, Corbyn. And ultimately, during the coup, he was seen by the Parliamentary Labour Party, the most right-wing Parliamentary Labour Party we've had, as their kind of spokesman to persuade Corbyn to step down when I was engaged in, uh, in trying to reach an accommodation. Um, and he pulled the plug on that when it was very clear he wasn't going to be successful. 
uh, and from there, uh, I never spoke to him again. And um, it was, I think I say in the book, in no, an ennoble and squalid way to end a valued friendship. You even you share the text messages that you sort of exchange, and he finishes with like a Buddhist, and they called a koan or a poem, or I don't know what the hell it is. And I thought, has he lost his mind? Has he sort of has he gone a bit batty? Because it was a very weird thing to send to you. You're saying, you know, you're having a quite straightforward political exchange. You've done wrong here. You know, you have to live with that. Yada yada yada. Then he starts like quoting Zen or something. Something yeah. uh, is that being disingenuous? He doesn't actually want to respond properly, or does he actually believe the crap coming out of his mouth? I think by then. He, he may have, you know, his, his his life began to change. He he lost an awful lot of weight, um, and I I genuinely think that he started to find more peace in his, in his personal life. Um, so uh, I've I've looked at that quote on a number of occasions, and I think that was his way of saying, "Look, I'm I've moved on, and you know." I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still fond of you. I forget what he says, but he says something. Oh, like that. that's worse. Well, a very nice reading. I see again Len McCluskey being the <laughs> nice guy. It's the media mischaracterization. <laughs> I mean, I would just say you've lost, you lost your marbles, mate. But I mean, it shows I'm a nasty person. <laughs> Labour were polling ahead of the Tories, 2017, 2018. I mean, much of 2017, pretty much the whole second half of that year, after an amazing general election result. 2018. It only starts to really kick in that they have problems early 2019. When was the moment you realised that Jeremy Corbyn wasn't going to be the Prime Minister? Oh, uh, <laughs> I realised that, oh gosh, way, way, way before the election. Um, the 2017 election was extraordinary and it's what I would say to all of your listeners and comrades out there, never, ever, ever allow the establishment or the right wing to um, obliterate 2017. They talk a lot about 2019 and Corbynism was destroyed because they never talk about 2017. Uh, it proved that a radical leader with a radical transformative program um, was popular. In, in the electorate, in the British electorate. And we should always seize on that. Uh, both Corbyn and MacDonald had done a remarkable thing. It's just a phenomenon um, that I've never experienced before. And so after 2017, on June the 9th, um, Corbyn was untouchable. And for the remainder of that year, um, he was in a pretty strong position, but it started to go wrong, in my opinion, in early 2018. Um, the whole issue, the seeds of a second uh, vote, um, the people's vote, and, uh, had started to be sown. And it was at that juncture that uh, Jeremy should have been a strong leader, and unfortunately he wasn't. And we seen then during 2018 the the people's vote gaining in um in in popularity we we were aware because we were constantly told it by the likes of the guardian and and, and others that uh, the vast majority of labor party members were remainers and wanted to look once again at the and challenge the referendum and it was evident to me that we were on the beginning of uh, a slippery slope, uh, which I raised with Jeremy um, right through 2018. Uh, it was growing and growing. You couldn't dismiss a million people out on, on the streets. Uh, you couldn't dismiss it. And a vacuum began to emerge in terms of leadership with leading uh, members of the Labour Party supporting and giving credence to the idea uh, that a second vote and a people's vote was something that was legitimate. Um, and, uh, of course... So ha let's go back a bit. How does that happen? 2017, you get this extraordinary result, and it's because Labour have, have basically said, we recognise the result of the referendum. Now, some people say, well, that was never good enough. Well, it was. So why didn't 
leading Labour MP stick to that position? Why do they suddenly go off in different directions? Well, you need you need a leader. It, it, it's why didn't Jeremy stick to that position? And I urged Jeremy and <clears throat> those around him to get him to send a letter out, a personal letter to every Labour Party member to say, look, I know there's many of you uh, are worried and are remainers, but trust me, this the, we've just fought an election saying we would recognise the 2016 referendum. This is about democracy, and this is the road for us to get into number 10. Just trust me, me, stick with me. 70% of them may have been remainers. 90% of them were Corbynites, were Corbyn supporters. He should have done that very early on. He should have said, I'm going to spend the next how many years up to the next election speaking to Remainers and trying to find out what their fears are so that we can put together uh, an appropriate programme. Uh, but that is the way he should have said to Emily Thornbury uh, and Keir Starmer, uh, you have a different view. You go and argue that from the backbenchers uh, because this is our position. And he never did that. And unfortunately, what then uh, emerged is this vacuum. And if there's a vacuum, especially in politics, well, vacuum anyway, if there's a vacuum, somebody will fill that vacuum. Mm. And we got to a lud ludicrous situation uh, in, in the uh, Labour Party conference in September 2018 where, where Stormer says, makes a speech and um, puts in the, and there will be remain as an option on the ballot paper. And the CLP delegates, uh, hundreds of them, rose, gave him a standing ovation. Oh my God, it's just unbelievable. I couldn't believe what was happening. The lack of clear leadership. If Jeremy had done what he should have done, first of all, there would have been no storm um, on, uh, you, you know, being the Brexit secretary. Uh, and therefore, there wouldn't have been that ambiguity about what is Labour's position. And there wouldn't have been the split, the very evident split that occurred. And so it was just tragic what, what had happened. It, 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 what people forget, Remainers and, you know, huge amounts of money involved behind their campaign, very clever and educated people. Uh, uh, and in the Labour Party, did they not realise that they were sowing the seeds of their own defeat? Because you might recall that after 2016, uh, when we voted to leave uh, the, the EU, UKIP vanished, mm. uh, just became a, you know, a, a, a sideshow. Uh, Farage uh, left to do other things. You know, it's the US, he was going to become a talk yeah. show host. Yeah, exactly. And what happened in 2019, because the unthinkable had suddenly become possible, i.e., We've had a referendum, a result has been declared, but now people are saying, hang on, we can reverse that. And what happens? They spawned the Brexit party. The Brexit party was born because he said, oh, hang on, maybe my work hasn't finished. From the moment the Brexit party uh, was born, it was evident, he said it often enough, it was evident that he was going to attack Labour mm. heartland seats. And I just was oh, beside myself that people couldn't see that. The leadership couldn't. Jeremy was lost to know what to do. Mm. He, Jeremy is somebody who, lovely, lovely man, decent, genuine man. He doesn't particularly like confrontation. And, of course, he was trying to figure out how to keep the two sides of his own party together. Remember, in his constituency, um, they'd voted 70% to remain. Mm. In Ian Lavery's constituency, the chair of the Labour Party, they'd voted 70% to leave. And he tried to not um, offend anybody. But of course, it, it, it just disintegrated into a, a, a ludicrous situation where uh, leaders of the party could say anything they liked. We then had, if you recall, in uh, 
in 2019, the European elections, mm. the most useless elections we've ever uh, had in, in the history of, of, of our nations. Um, and suddenly there was panic. In fact, it's my belief that John Mack, um, and, you know, I, I think he did a fabulous and remarkable job. I, I like him a lot, but I think he panicked. Because there was always. Can this I just thing. say, your book is very even handed in all of this stuff, which I really admire, and it's why people should read. You're not casting blame. You say he's done so much good, and then at this yeah. particular moment, he, he came up short. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, he did. John had this fear that the party might split, the Labour Party might split. Um, and I think exaggerated the, the Chukaramuna group those bunch of irrelevant individuals that nobody can remember their name of their names now anyway. Um, and felt that if we'd have become, if we'd have dismissed or remain as an option, the mind. and then of course, for some un unbelievable, uh, for <laughs> unbelievable reason, the European elections, people read into that, that the, the country was remain. You recall Labour, uh, did badly. The Tories did even worse. Mm. And the two winners, if that's the right terminology, was the Liberals and the Brexit Party. Mm. And all that election told us was that the country was still split down the middle. We knew that anyway. And I I took on the, the kind of scouse characteristic a stereotype of telling people to calm down, mm -hmm. calm down, calm down, stop panicking. I think John did panic. And I think we lost John at that stage. He started to believe that we should move to remain or at least uh, put it. And so it was awful. You asked me, when did I know we were going to lose? Almost um, almost as soon as, as, as that happened, you had Jeremy with his two closest friends, Diane Abbott and John Mack, in either ear, mm. uh, telling him that we had to move towards Remain. I don't believe Jeremy wanted to for one moment. Um, but it, it was lost. We, we were lost then. And uh, there was no way back. And I remember saying to John, I went to see him and I said, John, look, tell me how if we move towards Remain? Because I was only interested in Corbyn getting into number 10. That's all that was interesting me. How, if we move to remain, can we win? Because if you can explain that to me, I'll go to the top of, 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 of the highest building in London and start shouting, remain, remain, yeah. remain. And he gave me an answer. He said, Len, our, our troops are crumbling and without an army, we won't be able to win. I challenged that and I said, I'm not sure that's true, John. And he, he rebuked me and he said, I'm telling you it's true. I go round the mm -hmm. country, Len. You don't. And I said, okay, fair enough. But let me tell you this, John, I go around my members and in our heartlands, I am being told repeatedly by shop stewards that our members are turning against us and seeing it as a betrayal. That's what I'm being told. And I left the meeting and I said, I hope you're right and I'm wrong. Because it was clear and unfortunately what happened, happened. The European elections were really interesting because... For the second successive round of European elections, an explicitly Eurosceptic party finishes first. You have UKIP in, what, 2014, Brexit party this time. I think the Brexit party gets 10% more than the Liberal Democrats. Mm -hmm. Somehow, somehow, <clears throat> despite Nigel Farage being the first political leader who's not from either major party, coming first, not in one major election, but two, this is a sign that Britain doesn't want to leave the European Union. <laughs> And I and I, I I felt like, what does it take to get this through people's heads? If you don't have a soft Brexit, and people say, oh, that doesn't exist. All right, well, let's just say you leave the European Union, and we don't have what we have right now, which I think was very possible. We think that was very possible, right? If you don't do that, we're going to have what we have today, which is hard Brexit, um, and all the the chaos that, that ensues, and. My worry is, and it's something I've thought about actually in the subsequent years, is that, you know, I believe in a member, member led democracy. I do. I'm not saying I, you know, I believe in that Benite conception of the Labour Party. But it was also clear that the Labour membership itself was in noddy land about the issue. And I know there was a vacuum of leadership. And I know that obviously you've got this multi million pound campaign, all true. 
But I also think it told us something about the complexion of the Labour Party membership, which was disproportionately, not entirely, disproportionately southern, disproportionately larger cities, uh, disproportionately um, social liberal values. And that's not to say everyone in Labour was middle class, because that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a claim which is not true. And the idea that the people that joined Corbyn were higher incomes is also not true. <laughs> But it, it did suggest that there are downsides to being a membership a party, which is all about the membership, because those considerations of, well, OK, we do this, we can't form a government, seem secondary. Now, I was talking to people for most of 2019, and or the first half of 2019, and I was saying, well, if we, if we do this, then you're not going to have a socialist government. They said, oh, well, you know, and, I, and I just thought, what has happened to you? It was like a kind of a mass mania. A, a big psychological shift. Did it make you reconsider, you know, democratic democratic politics within Labour? No, but uh, Remain ISIS, as uh, I say in my book, was um, <clears throat> a disease that arrived before COVID. It did kind of um, distort people's thinking. And of course, I'm not going to attack those hundreds of thousands of people who joined <clears throat> Corbyn's Labour, it was fabulous to see so many young people. <clears throat> but of course, that's why the trade unions are important to Labour, because whilst, uh, you know, if I take one of our largest plants, Jaguar Land, Jaguar Land Rover in Solihull, 15,000 workers, how many of them are actually Labour Party members? I don't know. But the vast majority of them would be Labour uh, voters. And so the trade union values and thoughts and views are important to feed in. And they were um, uh, ignored in a way that, um, unfortunately, uh, it started to look like the London-centric metropolitan Labour Party were dismissing <clears throat> the views of ordinary working people. I'm going to have to push back on that a little bit because... The leadership of the GMB, a very large private sector trade union, you know, they sort of pride themselves on, and they, they, they do a great job. I know many, many people who've done very well out of the GMB representing them. They've fought very hard for their members. Being a sort of blue collar union, they adopted a second referendum. The TUC sort of championed a second referendum. So Remainitis wasn't just limited to... But that's not strictly true. And forget the TUC, because, of course, the majority of the TUC are not affiliated to the Labour Party. There's only 12 unions affiliated to the Labour Party. And those 12 unions, I have to say, at my instigation, put together a position that all 12 of us agreed with. And the key, uh, we put two options forward, and the second, uh, and the key uh, of the second option was that Labour's position would be that we would go into the election on the basis of respecting the uh, twenty sixteen um, referendum. This is in twenty eighteen, right? You're doing this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was Labour's position. That was the trade unions' position unanimously. Mm. All, all 12 unions, including the GMB, said our position is we'll go into this election uh, respecting the 2016 referendum. And if we win, we will take people out. We will take the, uh, us out of the European Union. And that was critical. Yes, to arrive at a compromise, we, uh, we said. And we will put that deal that we've concluded back to the people um, and an option on that ballot back to the people would be, or, or you can remain in the EU. Now that was, um, so that was a unanimous position that we adopted from the trade unions. And it was, it was a, a good position. There was an element of compromise in it. Uh, I remember Dave Prentice of Unison said, Len, you'd be prepared for, the, for there to be a referendum an, a, as an option on a deal going back to the people. And I said, yeah, I was absolutely confident that a Labour government, a Corbyn government, would take us out of the European Union and would do so on a deal that would then be accepted by the British people because 
we'd be all campaigning in mm. favour of that deal. Um, so the, that was the GMB's position as well. Uh, so we were united. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we had the ludicrous situation when it was eventually kind of uh, taken on board by the leadership of um, people like Emily Thornbury, uh, Keir Starmer, uh, John Mack, who were the negotiators and were being asked the question. So, OK, if Labour get into power, you'll take us out of the EU and you'll negotiate a deal and you'll put it back to the people will you campaign for that deal? And they would say, no, no, we'll campaign to remain. Or I've, never, I've never come across anything so stupid in politics in my life that here you were, you were telling the British people, we're sending a group of people in to negotiate the deal to take us out of the European Union. Um, we're going to put that back to the people, but the very people who've negotiated the deal are going to campaign against it. That would be like me with an employer saying, right, let's do a deal. Okay, we've reached a deal. And the employer saying, okay, great, we've reached a deal. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the deal. But by the way, I'm going to go outside now to my members and I'm going to campaign against the deal. Utter, utter nonsense, infantile uh, by those involved in it. And of course, the media. <laughs> the mm. media cut Labour to pieces. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy was forced in the end when he was, well, what's your position? And he, he said, well, I'll adopt a neutral position in a campaign like that. But meanwhile, you had the bold Johnson just winning an election on three words, get Brexit done. You write that you um, got on quite well with Keir Starmer initially. That surprised me. So you had, a, you had a rapport with him. Was that during the leadership election or from before? Or No, well, obviously I'd met Keir a number of times beforehand. Um, but the election, when uh, the election for the leadership uh, began, it was pretty clear to me very early on that he was going to win. Um, we uh, supported Becky, Becky Long-Bailey, um, and... It was clear to me that the campaign wasn't a particularly good one for Becky. Uh, there were all kinds of things wrong with it. It was stuttering and failing. And I was urged by some of my people to attack St Keir Starmer. And I said, I've got no intentions of doing that uh, because I believe uh, this guy's going to win. And um, we've got to try to influence like we always do. Um, and of course, the platform he ran on, the 10 pledges were Corbynesque. Everybody has kind of accepted that. So on the Friday before the announcement, um, on the Saturday, uh, I, we knew he'd won, obviously. We didn't know the figures, but it was very clear. I rang him and I said, listen, Kia, this is just to let you know that you should not see either me or Unite as your enemy. We've supported Long Bailey, but and of course his response to me was, Len, oh, don't worry about that. I tell my team that I have a good relationship with you, Len, and of course I respect Unite and I, I look forward to working with you. And then we began our... Um, our discussions and uh, I was on the phone, I don't know, for an hour and a half to him. And it this is straight after he wins? No, this is before he wins. Sorry, the day this before he wins. Yeah, the yeah. day before he wins. Wow. And it was really uh, good, very positive. He said, look, Glenn, I, uh, Jeremy set up a channel to speak to trade unions and I want to keep that. He said, but I want a personal channel of communication with you. And I said, okay, that's, that's fine, good. He talked about the most important thing as far as he was concerned was unity in the party. And he wanted, to, and I said, well, you'll get it because you'll certainly get the support of the left because um, uh, we're fed up for the last four years of being attacked by the mm. right wing. Everybody is now once a united party. Your, your pledges are good and <clears throat> and he, it was really, really extremely positive. Incidentally, I tried to get to. I said, "Who are you? Who are you, um, who are you going to have as your shadow chancellor? Are you going to tell me?" And he said, "Oh, I'm not going to tell you until I've spoke to them." 
And I said, because whoever your shadow chancellor is will be an indication as to what direction. There'd been a lot of rumours that Rachel Reeves was going to be the um, uh, shadow chancellor. And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you until I've spoken to them, Len. Um, and then on the Sunday after he'd announced his, uh, uh, because I mentioned Rachel Reeves to him, um, and he said, well, you'll have to wait to see. And then on the Sunday, he rang me when Annalise Dodds had been chosen. And I said, well, there you go. And I said, well, I'm relieved it's not Rachel because that would be a problem. Of course, look where we are now. And then he spoke to me on a number of occasions. I met him despite COVID restrictions uh, a few times. Um, and it was all very positive. And the strange things started to develop. I'd report back to my inner team. In, in Unite, uh, these conversations. But within a couple of days, Keir would do something completely different. And it got to the stage where uh, my team was saying to me, Lenny, it, it looks to us as though this fellow's taking the piss out of you. And I said that to Keir. I met him and I said, Keir, my people think you're kidding me along. You, you tell us this, but then you do that. No, no, he was very... And then, of course, it all unravels with the Jeremy Corbyn uh, suspension. Um, and I was asked, I was on a Zoom with, oh, you know, a couple of dozen leading left uh, comrades who said, this is just unbelievable. But before we declare war, uh, somebody needs to go and seek here. And I was... Um, I was chosen along with John Trickett and the pair of us the following day on a Friday went to see Kia, Angie Rayner and um, uh, Morgan McSweeney as Chief of Staff in Parliament to ask a simple question. Look, is, is, is there a negotiated settlement here that we can all get back? Otherwise, there's going to be problems. And um, he said, well, yeah, yeah, we don't want a war. So if we could reach uh, an agreement, a, a, a statement that Jeremy was prepared to make then. And I said, well, fine, let's work at that. Following day, uh, a statement was agreed. Jeremy was persuaded to accept the statement. Um, there would be a procedure that he'd have to go through an NEC panel. And... Um, he went through that panel and unanimously, there was five on the panel, only two of whom were Corbynites. Unanimously, they uh, lifted the suspension. We were all relieved, delighted, getting slaps on my back or well done. Uh, only within a few hours, it to be announced that uh, the whip had been withdrawn. I've never spoken to Keir Starmer since. And it's gone downhill ever since. Well, Keir Starmer also, from what you write in the book, told you that it was his decision to suspend Jeremy oh, yeah. Corbyn. Yeah, he says he has no choice. So what that what that what that means is that within hours of saying he would adopt the HRC's the HRC. proposals of an independent complaints process, yeah. he he undermined it himself. Yeah, he did that he, same day. That same day. Uh, that same day. And then, of course, I think they all realised, oh my God. And suddenly then it became um, uh, David Evans. The gen no, the general secretary made the decision, not me. That's a lie. And when trust is broken, it's very, very difficult to repair the damage. And uh, Keir was unbelievably <clears throat> uh, dishonest in, in what he did. Um, and of course, what's happened since then is... It's difficult to imagine the attack on the left wing, the democracy of the party. Um, it, it's the worst position I've ever personally known the Labour Party to be in. Um, and I'm going to say something now which uh, might sound far-fetched, but I, I think there's something sinister happening in the Labour Party at the moment. I don't know whether Keir Starmer is a babe in the political woods or a Machiavellian uh, right winger, but he's undoubtedly being captured by um, the right wing and the establishment. And when I say the establishment, I don't mean just in the Labour Party. I mean the people who 
who run our world for us. I think what is happening at the moment, and I think this is a, a deliberate ploy by the establishment, um, I think they're attempting to drive out completely the socialist trend within the Labour Party. I think there's an attempt, and maybe Tony Blair hoped for this in his time, to create the Labour Party as a mirror image of the Democratic Party in America. I believe there is a deliberate attempt to uh, not just marginalise the left or marginalise socialism. I think there's a deliberate attempt to squeeze it out of the party completely. I think I'd also add, people might say, well, the Democrats, you know, it could be worse. But take trade unions out of the Labour Party, get something like the US Democrats. By the way, without primaries, it's very centrally controlled in terms of who can go where. Without a state system, which means you can have a charismatic governor or a, a mayor, you know, we've got a very different life when it comes to local politics in this country compared to the US. So it would be like the worst of all worlds. First past the post, no primaries, ideologically right wing two. Basically, you have a choice of two ideologically right wing political parties. Yeah. Procedurally, you're still a democracy. But you look at countries in Europe, like I say, you look at the US, Britain would actually be in quite a unique situation in terms of the permitted ideological complexion of mainstream parties. I mean, that is something to worry about. Actually, I wouldn't even say Britain. I'll say England, because in Scotland, it's a bit different. And in Wales, it might be a bit different well, too. Well, and, and I, you know, I don't want to be too negative because I actually think that politics within the next five years is going to be extremely exciting and very volatile. And uh, comrades on the left, young people that have left us and all the rest of it, those values still exist. We're the only ones that have the answers to the inequality that exists and all the problems that exist is on the left. So we need to get our act together and we need to fight. I think there's going to be issues in relation to challenging uh, democracy or anti-democratic uh, behaviour by the Labour Party. Um, and also the whole issue of federalism may emerge again. You've got the, the, the mayors, in particular Andy Burnham, uh, challenging where power lies in Westminster, I think Scottish Labour uh, are in danger of, of, of withering on the vine unless they're more imaginative, embrace a second uh, independence uh, referendum, but at the same time uh, channel energy into the whole concept of a, a federal UK. I think there are still good things to fight for, but we've got to be alert and aware to what is happening before our very eyes and to our party. Um, we've got to be aware of that in order to combat it. Angela Rayner, she was privy to these conversations. She's kept a low profile. Do you trust her? Yeah, I, Angie is, um, you know, she, she is what she is, Angie. She sometimes uh, uh, says things without um, properly considering the... Uh, the consequences. Um, and I know at the moment, because uh, I've spoken to Angie, um, that she's trying her best in the current storm of climate to um, balance some of the uh, more outrageous things that, um, that are, are being done there. So, yeah, I think Angie uh, at heart is still... Uh, who she is and where she comes from. Um, it'll be interesting if the next election comes. I've got a feeling it might be next year. I think it might be next October. Um, I think at the moment, although Keir Starmer's best friend is Boris Johnson, and there are problems in the economy, the energy crisis, uh, etc. And you know, maybe Storm will be in with. Uh, with a shout out, he can't possibly win an overall majority, but maybe a hung parliament. I don't think he will. Um, and then it'll be a question if that happens and he steps aside uh, as to who the next leader of the Labour Party uh, will be. And um, I'm sure Angie will uh, consider 
to be one of those candidates. Uh, I've already mentioned Rachel Reeves. There may be others. Andy Burnham? Yeah, I think... Would uh, you like to see him as the next Labour leader? Uh, well, that's a... Look, I think... Or do you think you could do a good job as Labour leader is a better way of putting it? Okay, I don't want to give Andy the kiss of death here, but <laughs> the truth of the matter is we'll know whether or not he's serious about leading the Labour Party if he runs as an MP at the next election. If he runs as an MP, then he's not running simply to sit on the back benches. And he may well be an interesting candidate. Now, whether him and Angie would run against each other, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. So, uh, But I do believe the left, this is where it, it's my view that the left needs to be mature because the rule changes. If Labour lose the next election and if Keir Starmer steps down, nobody on the left is likely to be on the ballot paper because of the rule change that has just been introduced. And therefore, the left needs to be mature enough to try to decide what is best for the party and for the radical traditions of the party. Um, we're not going to move. We're very much on the right of the party and continue to move that way at the moment. We're not going to move back to a... a, a a Jeremy Corbyn position, but we may move back to a soft Labour, soft left, sorry, soft left position. And the left, in my opinion, need to be mature when they give consideration to that. Um, and so, as I say, it's going to be an exciting period and a very fluid situation in politics in, in the next few years. Yeah, I think that's so important to state. You know, I saw, because we've got this debate right now about the minimum wage, and I think in 2014, Ed Miliband was saying, by 2020, I want a minimum wage of £9 an hour, you know? And it's 9.50 under the Tories, and yeah. the Tories are saying it'll be 10.50 before the next election, and you think, okay, things have really outpaced yeah. what people expected. Final question, because you've indicated what you think will happen at the next general election. Are trade unions in this country better prepared to fight back against falling living standards today than they were when you became United General Secretary in 2010? Um, I'm probably best making two comments here. One about my own union. The answer to that is an undoubtedly we are better prepared. I mean, uh, as we talk, uh, there are literally dozens of strikes taking place within Unite. And it's because the workers have confidence. They're getting £70 a day strike pay. And that gives workers confidence that at least they've got some money to pay bills and buy food. As a result of that, um, we are winning disputes left, right and centre. And they're primarily about pay at the moment, although fire and rehire has emerged. So, yeah, I, I think uh, the answer, okay, from Unite's perspective, we are definitely in a stronger position. And I think other unions are also um, uh, recognising that uh, this is such a critical point in time for working people that, yeah, we've got to fight back. We've got to make certain that it's not ordinary working people paying the price for this system that is clearly broken. And the governments of the day are not prepared to do anything to mend it. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping so. I, I've urged m my colleague unions, I'm not trying to teach my grandma how to suck eggs here, but I do think they should examine the process of leverage, how you can take on an employer. We definitely uh, would encourage everyone to create a strike fund so that workers uh, don't feel starved back or afraid to stand up for their, their rights. I learned that throughout my life. I was on strike on a number of occasions. We never got strike pay and it, it, it was difficult, very, very difficult. So, um, and I always thought to myself, historically, this is what happens. Workers are starved back into work. And I always thought when, if I ever got to a stage where I was, uh, 
uh, I, I was in power, I would create a strike fund that would give working people confidence. And in Unite, we certainly have that confidence now. And I would urge all of the unions to, you know, take a close look at that. Len, pleasure as always. Great book. Good to talk. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you.